Well, now we come to the Word of God, and we are continuing our series in the book of 1 Corinthians. If you weren't here with us last week, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, this troubled church, and they have divisions within their ranks. Some are following Paul, some are following Apollo, some are following Peter. And at the end of last week's passage, Paul said, Christ called me to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the gospel would be emptied of its power. And so now we pick up in chapter 1, starting in verse 18. We're going to go through the end of the chapter today. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, to the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord for us this morning. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. In the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may sit down. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we seek to uh, understand and apply his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for the incredible depths of your wisdom that you have revealed in your plan of salvation. We ask that you would help us to better understand it now as we look at your word. We ask that your power would be made evident, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would impress these truths on our hearts in fresh ways. We come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and in his authority we pray, amen. Well, the same event can often elicit two very opposite reactions. Take politics, for example. This November, someone is going to win the election. And I can guarantee you, whoever wins the election, one half of our country are going to think, the, the country is in a great place. We're going to go forward because of this candidate. And the other half of the country is going to say, our democracy is ruined. We're not going to make it. Think of the world of sports. Some of you like the Bears or the NFL. You'll be watching a game today. And undoubtedly, there'll be a questionable call on the field. And for some of you, when you get that call back, you will be ecstatic. You say, that's the right call. And the other team, their fans are going to think that was the worst call in the history of football. Think of the art world. This is a little out of my range, so bear with me. Think of a, an exhibit, an abstract art exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago. If you go there and look at the art exhibit, some of you would look at that art and you would say, that is a masterpiece. I've never seen anything like it. And if you're like me and don't know much about art, you might think, well, I could probably do that. I'd just throw some paint on the wall and it would get there. Same event, two very opposite reactions. And as we look at our passage in 1 Corinthians 1 today, we'll see that the word of the cross, the gospel message, 
elicits two very different reactions. And this is exactly how God in his wisdom has designed it. And today's text will re reveal to us that we are in one of two camps, one that embraces the wisdom of God or one that embraces the world's wisdom. And the call for us today coming from this text is this. Embrace the wisdom of God by believing in the word of the cross. Embrace the wisdom of God or God's wisdom by believing in the word of the cross. And you may hear that and say, well, I don't even need to listen. I've already believed in the word of the cross. I, I can just go to lunch early. Well, not so fast. Because as we believe in the word of the cross, if that's you today, yes, you believed once and for all that Jesus was your savior. But we need to continue believe, continually believe in this message every day throughout our lives because we are bombarded from every direction to not believe in this way. And so our text breaks down into two main sections and each section gives us a reason why we should believe or continue believing in this word of the cross. And the first reason comes in verses 18 to 25 and that's because uh, the word of the cross is the power of God. And the second reason is because Jesus is the only one worthy of our boasting. That's in verses 26 through 31. Jesus is the only one worthy of our boasting. So let's first consider how this word of the cross is the power of God today. Well, first we need to define the terms that Paul is using. Back in verse 17, he says that Christ sent him to preach the gospel. And then here in verse 18, he, he calls that the word of the cross. And then in verse 23, he'll summarize his message by saying, we preach Christ crucified. So which is it? What is, what is he preaching? The answer is yes. All of, the, uh, all of the above. The gospel, the word of the cross, Christ crucified, they're all referring to the same message. It's this glorious message, the greatest message the world has ever known, that Jesus Christ, being God, being the second person of the Trinity, came to earth and lived as a man, a perfect man, the God-man. And he died on a Roman cross for rebels like you and me and the whole human race by taking the wrath of God against sin upon himself. And if we believe in that, he forgives us of our sins. Jesus died and he rose again three days later, proving that he was the eternal son of God. And this message, this gospel message, this message of Christ crucified, ever since it happened in the first century has been transforming countless people throughout the whole world ever since. But this message is not received in the same way by all. And you know that if you've uh, been alive any amount of time. It is divisive. The word of the cross divides all humanity into two camps. And the way you know which camp you're in is by your response to this message. So Paul lays it out in verse 18. He says this, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What does that mean? That means right now, you are in one of those two camps. There's no middle road, there's no riding the fence. You are either in the process of perishing on the road to eternal destruction, what the Bible calls hell, eternal separation from God forever, or you are being saved possessing eternal life right now that will be fully consummated in heaven. And you may be wondering, well, what does it mean that some are being saved? I thought I was saved at one time. What is it, why does Paul say some are being saved? Well, Alistair Begg, a pastor, uh, once gave an insightful comment about this. He said that salvation frees us from the penalty of sin <clears throat> at conversion. And he, it frees us from the power of sin as we live our daily lives and from the presence of sin after death. So by referring to believers in Jesus as those who are being saved, Paul is emphasizing the strong power of the gospel. It continues throughout our lives. But starting in verse 19, however, he explains why the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. And he, he does so by quoting from Isaiah 29 in the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. If you went to Isaiah 29 and you looked at the verse in verse 14, it wouldn't be exactly like 
the one you're reading here. That's because it's the Greek version of the Old Testament. So listen to what he says in verse 19. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So to give you some context back in Isaiah's prophecy, God made this declaration to a people whose uh, lips were confessing God, but their hearts were far from him. And so back in Isaiah 29, God said that he would show them wonder upon wonder, and then he would destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning, he would thwart or hide. So in effect, what is Paul doing? He is saying that this scripture in Isaiah has been fulfilled with the crucifixion of Christ. You see, the cross was God's greatest wonder. And through the cross, the wisdom of the wise of this world has been destroyed and brought to nothing. Well, how is that so? Well, Paul is going to explain to us in verse 20 and beyond. He says this in verse 20. What, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Now, Paul is just rolling out the highfalutin of that society in Corinth. The wise were the sophists, the philosophers, if you, the PhDs, if you will. Where are the scribes? The scribes were the teachers of the law, the Jewish teachers of the law, the religious leaders of the day. Where's the debater of the age? This was those traveling rhetoricians we talked about last week. They would give great speeches and be persuasive of the people in Corinth. It was their entertainment. It was also their way of learning about the world. He's saying, where are all these people? What, where are they in the process of salvation and coming to know the way to God? Where are they in shaping the church? His implied answer is, they are nowhere to be found. They're not part of it at all. And the end of verse 20 into verse 21 tells us why this is true, why the experts of this world are not included in God's plan of salvation. Paul says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So in effect, Paul is just driving in on the same point. He's continuing to show that that Isaiah 29 passage he just quoted has come to pass. He is saying that through the gospel message, God has, has destroyed and made foolish the wisdom of the world. You see, God has set up this world so that there's no amount of human wisdom that can lead you to God. There is no moral code that can cleanse your heart. There's no philosophy that can cleanse your sins. There are all sorts of worldview systems out there that try to find their way to God through human wisdom, and they are all futile in getting to God. Listen again to what Paul says will get you to God in the second half of verse 21. He says, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This tells us that God finds pleasure. He is well pleased through the unexpected working, uh, through working in unexpected ways. He was pleased to use this message that society deemed as foolish to save those who believe. Paul explains why this message was folly to the world in verse 22. He says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. He, he splits the unbelieving world into two camps, the Jews and the Greeks or the Gentiles. Let's take each one in their order. He says, Jews demand signs. This meant that the Jewish leaders had developed certain expectations of how the Messiah would be revealed through the miracles of God. They thought the Messiah would come in power and take over Israel and conquer the world. They were expecting signs and power. And the Greeks seek wisdom. Paul is characterizing all non-Jews here as the Greeks, meaning those influenced by Greek culture. He says that they trusted in their own system and wisdom to guide them in life. But this was a worldly wisdom. It was centered on themselves, completely devoid of God. This wisdom was based on thinking of ancient Greek philosophers like Protagoras, who famously said, man is the measure of all things. I wonder if that phrase sounds familiar to you. That is a refrain of our world today. Man is the measure of all things. Humans, we, we can figure it out on our own. 
Well, Paul's message of the cross did not fit into the Jews or the Greeks' understanding of reality. And on one level, this is not surprising because human beings have long dismissed truth that doesn't seem to fit our understanding. One very well-known example of this happened hundreds of years ago in 1633 when the Italian astronomer Galileo was condemned by the Pope and he was put under house arrest for his scientific views that didn't align with the church's understanding at that time. I want us to listen to what Galileo was accused of. This was his first accusation. This was his first charge. The proposition that the sun is the center of the world and does not move from its place is absurd and false philosophically and formally heretical and expressly contrary to holy scripture. That was his first charge. The second charge, the proposition that the earth is not the center of the world and immovable, but that it moves is equally absurd and false philosophically and theologically considered at least erroneous in faith. That was what was charged against Galileo. You see, he was rejected by the church because of his position. Although it was true, it didn't align with the prevailing understanding of the world at that time. And in the same way, Jesus was rejected by the Jews and the Greeks because of their inability to accept God's wisdom and abandon their own. Well, against this backdrop of the current cultural narrative in Corinth, Paul articulates the message once again that he has been giving using just two words in verse 23. He, he, he says his message is Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Listen to what he says there. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. You see, this message of the Messiah dying on a Roman cross did not fit the first century understanding of how the world should work and how it did work. Christ crucified was a shocking message. Well, why was it so shocking? Well, it was a stumbling block to Jews because in Deuteronomy 21, God said that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed by God. So just imagine what the message of Christ crucified would have sounded to a faithful Jew hearing the message back then. Your, your promised Messiah was hung on a tree he was cursed by God. According to their understanding of what the Messiah was, who, what he would do, this would have been unthinkable to the Jews. So the message was a stumbling block to Jews, but it's also folly to Gentiles. Because in the gospel, the Gentiles encountered a message about the supposed Savior of the world dying on a cross, and they could not accept it. They hated the cross. One philosopher named Cicero offered this perspective on the Roman crucifixion about 100 years before Paul wrote these words. Cicero said this, he said, the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. You see, to a, a non-Jew, the idea that the savior of the world was a poor Jewish man from some backwater country who was crucified on a cross would have been nonsensical. It would have been nonsensical and laughable to the average Corinthian. And for some of us here today, the message of the cross has become just so familiar to us. We have crosses around our necks. We know the message of the cross. And we know it so well that we've forgotten the scandal of it. We must remember that crucifixion was a shameful way to die in the first century. One of the most shameful ways ever invented. It was reserved for the lowest of criminals. Rome wouldn't even let its citizens die in this way. But God, in his wisdom, used this surprising method to save sinners, to save you and me through his son dying on a cross. So the message had substantial barriers. It faced substantial barriers in the first century, and it still does today. But not everyone rejects it which is what Paul described in verse 24. He says this, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, in the wisdom of God. So amidst all the barriers of receiving this gospel message of, of a Savior crucified on a tree, 
He says there are some who received the message, who believed in it. And who are they? He says they are those that are called by God. Notice that those who are called here in verse 24 is the same group as those who are being saved from verse 18. It's also the same group as those who believe in verse 21. Paul uses these terms interchangeably, which shows us that God saves by calling individuals to himself who then respond in faith by believing in Jesus. God is sovereign over salvation, and we have a responsibility to respond. Both of those things are true. Well, to those who are called, the word of the cross, the message of Christ crucified, it's not folly, it's beautiful, because it's the power of God, and it's the wisdom of God. We're going to talk about how it's the wisdom of God in a moment, but let's first consider why this is the power of God. Why is this message of Christ crucified the power of God? Well, Paul explains it this way in Romans chapter 1. In verse 16, he says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In other words, this is the only way, the one way that God has designed for our sins to be forgiven. This is the only way to have our heart cleansed. It's by believing that Jesus Christ was crucified for you. By believing that Jesus took the punishment that you deserved, the wrath of God against your sin, he took upon himself on the cross. And maybe this morning you are here and you are realizing, I don't know this power of God in my life. I've heard some of this message, but I, I've not experienced this power in my own life. And maybe the message of the cross has seemed very foolish to you until now, but the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. If that's you today, I would say, let today be the day of salvation for you. Don't leave without putting your faith and hope and trust in Jesus. You can do that by repenting of your sins, confessing your sins to God, repenting of them, turning from them and turning to Christ, believing in him in faith, saying you want him to be the Lord of your life. If you do that, you will be saved. Remember, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, no other name than Jesus. So if you're in that camp today, I pray you would put your trust in him. But most of us have done that. We have put our trust in Jesus And we have been set free. Our heart has been cleansed. Our sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. And so I don't need to tell you, you know why the message is the power of God because you have experienced that power. But I wonder, has this news become old to you? Are you still in awe of this news? Does this news still cause you to weep when you think of it? Or have you moved past the gospel? Have you moved past and you're, you're on to other parts of the Christian life? Friends, we never move past this news. We, we must continue to believe and, and remember what he's done for us. Well, Paul goes on to say, somewhat tongue-in-cheek in verse 25, he says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Of course, if you know your theology, you know that God has no foolishness in him. He has no weaknesses. But this supposed foolishness, this supposed weakness that the world is saying of this message, it's all stronger than the world's strength. It's wiser than the worldly wisdom that's out there. So God's apparent foolishness and weakness defeats the wisdom and strength of man every time. Well, what does this mean for us today? How how might we apply this section of the text into our lives? Well, like Paul, we must not try to dress up the gospel message to make it seem more cool or more relevant. It's relevant. It's a relevant message in itself. We don't need to dress it up ourselves. We also must not subtract from the message to make it easier for some other people to believe, to take away some of the the hard parts of the gospel. Because the word of the cross is, by definition, an offensive message. Because it cuts 
deep into the core of our pride. The word of the cross tells me that my sin was so bad that the perfect Son of God had to die for me. There was nothing I could do about my sin. This problem, this disease of sin in my heart, there's nothing I could do. The word of the cross tells me only Jesus could pay this penalty. Only Jesus could cleanse me. So by way of application, if you know Jesus this morning, I would ask you, what prevents you from sharing this message with others? Is it because you can perceive that others will think it is foolish? That you might be laughed at for believing it? Maybe you need to remember afresh that there is no other way that your unbelieving friends will be saved. Only through the foolishness, the apparent foolishness of this message. And yes, this message is foolish to some. They may, you may be laughed at as you share it with friends. But they are the ones who need to hear it the most. Because they are the ones, God says, are perishing. They are headed for eternal destruction. And so I would ask, would you ask God this week to give you an opportunity to share this message with someone who doesn't know it? Would you just pray, asking God to give you the boldness to share this message? Well, the first reason here that we must believe in the word of the cross is because it's the power of God. The second uh, brings us to the second reason we must believe in the word of the cross, and that's because Jesus is the only one worthy of our boasting. You see, we can boast in a lot of things in our life. We can boast in our possessions, in our education, in our looks. We can boast in all sorts of things. But Paul is saying the only thing that we can boast in, the only person we can boast in is Jesus Christ himself. Sometimes I hear people say something to this effect of, uh, they'll see a really influential person and they'll say, wouldn't it be awesome if that person came to Christ, they would make such a big impact on the kingdom. You might have said this about some people. Well, there's some faulty thinking in this because God doesn't need the famous or the wealthy or the powerful or the influential to trust in him in order to advance his plan in the world. In fact, in these verses that we're gonna talk about, it will show us that he purposely chooses people into his kingdom that we would never choose ourselves. Paul reminds the Corinthians of this very fact in verse 26. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Paul's not trying to discourage them, although it could be a little bit discouraging. Like, hey, you guys were a bunch of nobodies. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying that the vast majority of them were not in a high position of society when they believed in the gospel. And this makeup of the Corinthian church and of all churches is designed purposely by God because God chooses very differently than we would choose if we were in charge of the church, if we were making the choices. If it were up to most of us, we'd choose the best and the brightest and the most beautiful. But we must not forget that God does not see as man sees. Listen to who he chose to be part of his church, starting in verse 27. It says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Now, this doesn't mean that people from higher classes of society cannot come to Christ. In fact, there is some indication that there were a few members of the church in Corinth who were wealthy and influential. There was people like Crispus and Stephanus. They seemed to have wealth and influence. But it does mean that God purposely chooses people who are not the cream of the crop, that are not the ones that are standouts in any type of way to be part of the church. This is the heart of God. We can see this theme throughout Scripture. It's how God works. He chose Israel. It's not, not the greatest of nations. It was an insignificant nation, apart from God blessing it. He chose Moses, who had trouble speaking. He chose David, who was the youngest of his brothers, to be king. 
And he chose Mary, a very poor, young, peasant woman, to give birth to the Savior of the world. And Jesus himself, he chose 12 disciples who were fishermen. They were ordinary people. They were tax collectors despised by others. And he chose you, and he chose me. See, friends, God delights in calling ordinary people into his kingdom. But it begs the question, why does he do this? Why does God work in this way? Well, Paul gives us two reasons in the text. The first is to shame the haves of society, those who have it all together. The verses we just read says that he chose the foolish, the weak, and the low, and despised. The have-nots to shame the wise, the strong, the haves. See, God calls lowly people to, to show that it's not one's gifts, it's not one's wealth or influence that can save your soul. Second reason God works in this way is told to us in verse 29. So that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Why are you a follower of Christ today? If you know and love Jesus, why are you a follower of Christ today? I can tell you why you're not one of the reasons not, <laughs> why you're not a, uh, that wasn't the reason, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's not because of your incredible wisdom. It's not because of your skills. It's not because of what you look like. It's not because of anything in you, anything that you bring to the table. You are a follower of Christ today because God chose you. And in response to his love towards you, you've admitted your spiritual poverty before God. You've admitted that you have nothing to bring to him, and you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. That is why you are a Christian today. Not because of anything you've done, not because of anything you've brought to the table. And the reality is, is that we can never bring anything but ourselves to God. He doesn't need our wealth, he doesn't need our contacts, he doesn't need anything we would offer, but he wants us. And once he has us, he showers blessing upon blessing upon blessing on us. Paul says in verse 30, because of him, God the Father, we are in Christ Jesus. In other words, our standing is all because of God. It's all because of his redeeming love. It's all because of his grace. So friend, you are a Christian today because of God's great love for you. And because of his grace that was extended to you. You are in Christ because of God. Verse 30 goes on in saying that Jesus became to us wisdom from God. And then he describes what that means. What does it mean that Jesus is the wisdom of God? It's kind of like a semicolon should be there. He became to us a wisdom from God. Paul says that it's because he's our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. So Jesus is our righteousness. In him, we are declared not guilty, and we are given his perfect record. He is our sanctification. In Christ, we are set apart. We are made holy. He has granted us holiness when we believe in him, and he is our redemption. In Christ, we have been freed from the bondage of sin. We have been forgiven. We have been counted not guilty, and all of this is a gift from our gracious God. It is infinite wisdom. All of this has been done for us by Christ's death on the cross. That's why it's the wisdom of God. All of this is yours because of Christ crucified for you. There's none of us who know and love Jesus who have anything to boast about before God. It's all a gift. Paul confirms this with the scripture. He says, so that as it is written, let no one who boasts boast in the Lord. You may remember the Corinthians were boasting in the various teachers who had come through the way. They, they were boasting in Paul. Hey, I follow Paul. They were posting, boasting in Apollos, who we talked about last week, had some riz with him. And he was, they were, they were uh, boasting in that. Some were boasting in Cephas or Peter. But Paul is showing them emphatically why this is wrong. The reality of the gospel message is such that the only one we can boast in is Jesus Christ. And here at the end of the passage, Paul quotes from a portion of Scripture that's recorded in two different places. It's recorded at the end of Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2 in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. And in Jeremiah 9, verses 20, uh, in verse 23, there at the end. 
And I'm going to quote from the, the portion of Jeremiah, the longer quote that I had at the beginning of the call to worship. This is what the full quote says. Paul has kind of shortened it for us in 1 Corinthians. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast in his might, and let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. In other words, the only one we have to boast in is Jesus, that we know him. He has loved us. That is what we can boast in. And so as we apply this section of the text, I want you to ask yourself two self-diagnostic questions. What are you boasting in and what does God owe you? What are you boasting in and what does God owe you? First, what are you boasting in? So as you think about your life, how you live your life, what are you boasting in today? In other words, where's your hope? Where is your identity? Where is your security? When, when things go wrong, where do you go? Are you boasting in your family, your connections? Are you boasting in the school that you're at or that you graduated from? Are you boasting in your bank account and the, the money that you have? Are you boasting in your looks, your nationality, your job? Are you boasting in Christ? You see, the Lord strips us of all our self-righteousness when we come to him. He takes away all the fig leaves we try to present ourselves to him with. And he gives us his son who becomes our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And he does this so that we would boast in him alone, so that he alone would get the glory. But this doesn't just happen one time when we come to Christ, although it does happen then. We must continue to boast in Christ, even when he gives us good gifts, even when he blesses our lives here on earth. It's only as we grow in our understanding of what Christ has done for us in the gospel that we will continue to grow in our boasting of Christ. So that first question, what are you boasting in? Second question I want you to ask yourselves is, what does God owe you? You see, sometimes we can be deceived into thinking that since we've given our life to Jesus, that God owes us something. He might owe us good health or long life or pleasures in this world. As if salvation was some kind of bartered transaction. Yeah, I'll give you my life, and then you're going to give me all these good things. Well, if you think this way, if you think that God owes you something, when life doesn't go well, when trials hit, where difficulty comes, you will be angry at God. You will be furious at times that God is treating you in this way. So friends, we need to recalibrate our thinking. God does not owe you anything. In fact, it's quite the other way around. You owe your life to him, period, no matter what. No matter what would come, no matter what he'll bring into your life. But when you do that, when you trust in Christ, the glorious thing is that he transforms your life. He forgives your sin. He makes you holy in his sight. He gives you freedom and a future behind, beyond your wildest dreams. And therefore, our boasting should only be in him, that we know him and that he has saved our soul. Well, as we close, there's an old hymn that summarizes what I think is the appropriate response to this word of the cross. It says this. It says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore them, bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. And then the chorus goes like this. I won't start singing it. I'll just say it. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Friends, the word of the cross is the power of God for those of us who believe. And so if you know Jesus, would you rejoice in this power today? Would you boast in him? If you don't yet know Jesus, let today be the day of salvation. Let's pray together. Father, how we do glory in the cross. 
as we see this message that is foolishness to the world, that it doesn't make sense to some, but Lord, as your spirit has worked in our hearts, we see that it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we rejoice. We rejoice that Jesus bore the burden to Calvary, that you have taken our sins and washed them clean washed our hearts, given us new hearts. And so, Lord, today, help us to boast in you. Help us to remember what you have done and help us to live in the power of the cross. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen.